All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Sam Silverstein, who is in St. Louis, Missouri. How are you doing, Sam? I'm great, John. How are you today? I'm very, very good. Thank you. And Sam is the founder of the Accountability Movement, which is focused on building powerful communities filled with people and organizations that know their values, live their values, and keep their commitments. And today, what we want to talk about is leadership and accountability. And and Sam, you're very specific about the accountability piece, right? Um, so it's not just leadership, but it's leadership and accountability. So explain to me um, why the accountability piece is so significant. Well, our position is accountability is the highest form of leadership. I was talking with my publisher this morning, actually, and he says he's being inundated with authors that are proposing books on different leadership styles. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's all a bunch of baloney. I, I think that uh, I think there either you're accountable to your people or you're not. And if you're not an accountable leader, then uh, then it your leadership style is 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 it sucks. It's right. not going to work. <laughs> and so, but we have to understand that accountability is not getting things done. People think accountability is the same as responsibility. We're mm -hmm. responsible for things. We're accountable to people. And so accountability is all about a commitment to an individual, to a person, or to a group of people. And so the accountable leader understands it's not about their people being accountable to them first. The accountable leader knows that they have to take the responsibility to create an environment that inspires accountability for people to be their best, and they do that by being accountable first to their people. Since it's about the human connection, that's why it's the highest form of leadership. So talk to me a little bit about how that works in practice. What does it look like when a leader is being accountable to his people, his or her people? Well, well exactly. And so what it looks like is the leadership is first, if they're not using accountability to manipulate their people to do more. Mm -hmm. And they understand that accountability is not a way of doing, it's a way of thinking. Specifically, it's how you think about your people. So it starts to manifest itself in these commitments. One of the commitments is a commitment to the values. Mm -hmm. Organizations are great at coming up with <laughs> mission statements, vision statements. They create this list of values. And then, you know, it kind of goes on the wall or it goes in the drawer and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. The reality is the accountable leader is living those values first. They're modeling the values. They're teaching the values. They're making decisions that are connected to the values always 100% of the time. And then, and only then, they expect their people to do the same in return. That's a commitment that the leader makes on the front end. And we see all the time organizations that they make decisions that that don't connect to the values right. and there's inconsistency. And so what happens is that's a lack on the part of leadership because right. if you know if if you work for me and you're making decisions that don't connect to the values and I allow you to stay in the organization, sure. that's on me. Yeah. I'm you know, I'm as a leader coming up short. Yeah. So um, I I do I love the concept of accountability because I think if you assemble like a hundred people and say is accountability important a hundred percent of them would say yes but most people then in practice think accountability starts with somebody else right it's it's yes you need to be account i agree everybody should be accountable so i'm going to hold everybody accountable but holding yourself accountable is is harder right and it's obviously the starting point so so if you're a leader of a of a big organization um and you have your values and principles or whatever how do you ensure that this permeates the whole organization obviously starting with yourself but how, how do you get it to infuse the organization well and th therein lies the challenge so here's what we've discovered there's two parts to an organization there's the tactical side of your business mm -hmm. and there's the spirit of your business right. now what we tend to do is we tend to focus 98 percent on the tactical and that's where we make the mistake because what happens is no matter how good you get at the tactical it's not going to help the spirit of who you are as an organization this is going to connect to your organizational culture and so but when you focus on the spirit and you improve the spirit and the culture of the organization, then what happens, people are freed 
to take the tactical to levels that we never before imagined. And so I don't care if you're an organization of 26 people that we've worked with, an organization of 17,000 that we've worked with, it's the culture that's gonna drive everything. And that's where those values are, are, are utilized because those values define the culture. So it starts with the leader. It starts with the leader making sure that we know what the values are, that they're taught, that they're modeled, and that people are making decisions. It's a conversation that can never end. And if you're right. just focused on the tactics of the business and you're just focused on the bottom line, then people think, well, that's all he cares about or all she cares about. When you're focused on the people, when you're focused on the culture, when you're focused on being accountable to help them be their best, then what happens is whether you have two employees or 20,000 employees, all of them will focus on the bottom line and you're going to get a better bottom line. Right. So do you think one of the um, one of the mistakes or one of the things that I've seen a lot um, over over my business career is, yeah, you're right. Companies will spend a lot of time coming up with their mission statement and their values and whatever. And and oftentimes they tend to be esoteric or or they tend to be a lot of them or whatever. And those are really hard then to translate into practical action to live out. So do you, do, you, do you find a lot of organizations, it's kind of a nice exercise, but there's no way of implementing it? Um, yeah, because they just don't understand what they can and what they can't do. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we lead organizations through this, through this uh, discovery of what their values are. We don't determine them. They right. determine them. Mm -hmm. And we see organizations that they'll range anywhere from 3, 10, 7, 13. Um, one of my books, Non-Negotiable, was written about a bank that has 20 values. And you go, wow, 20 <laughs> values, that's a lot. I know, you're laughing. Yeah. But they work for them. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, you know, I'll share one with you just to give you an idea. Um of, of what it means, integrity, character, our reputation is everything. Do what's right, always, every time, anytime, no matter what it costs, no matter who it offends, no matter the perceived consequence, encourage it, reward it, revere it, make it the mantle that we are known for, it is expected. Now, is there any doubt what integrity means in this organization? No, and, and what I love about what you just outlined there is that is very specific, it's very direct, and it's very easy to understand, right? Right. Now, see, what most companies do is they have some little pretty plaque on the wall, and it has those three words, those five words, those seven words. Now, you and I... If, if I said, okay, write down the definition of integrity. Well, if you did that and I did that and my wife did that and my next door neighbor did that and your next door neighbor did that, you know, we'd end up with five different definitions of integrity. Now, right. they might be similar that, and I'm sure that they would connect, but the reality is they would be different. The fact is we need to know in this organization, what does it mean? How do we live it? How do we make decisions based around it? What does it look like? And, and now that clarity, I don't need to come to you, my boss, and ask you to help me make decisions. Mm -hmm. I know that if I make decisions based on the values and I fully understand what the values are, I'll always be rewarded for making decisions that connect to those values, even if the outcome is less than desirable. Yeah, and I think, again, I think the really key takeaway point here for everybody is that idea of clarity, because you're correct. Um, it's like if you have a business strategy, but you haven't explained it properly, then everybody will interpret it. If you have values or as you outlined there and you don't come up with a really specific definition of what they mean in this business then people will interpret them so you'll then you'll end up with a different level of experience from different people exactly now, now here's the key though john mm -hmm. uh, values aren't policies mm -hmm. and there's a difference values are not about things values are about people Values are about people. Uh, one of the clients that we were leading through the process of discovering what their values were, and they already had a list of values, but they wanted to start from scratch, which you know I admire them for that. And so we did that. And during the process, the CEO said, uh, "You know, we value community service. Matter of fact, we value it so much that in our policy manual, it says every employee can take two days paid and perform community service." Right now. He was really proud of that. So my assistant asked him, uh, just out of curiosity, how many paid days did you have <laughs> last year where people performed community service? And at that time, he had about 275 employees. And he paused and he looked to the person in the room that would know the answer to that question. And she thought for a second. And then she responded, zero. Yep. 
Now, the reason it was zero is because community service was a policy. It was not a value. If you can't show me where it's happening in your organization, it's not a value. Mm -hmm. So we we helped them write what that value would look like. And literally within 30 days, uh, my inbox was flooded with emails of, of, of links to newspaper articles, to TV uh, uh, pieces that were done on them, where their people were out in the community making a difference, helping people, performing community service, because it went from a policy to a value. And for it to be a value, it has to show up. Yeah. And 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 no, I, I agree completely. And I think uh, what we see a lot of the time is nice ideas. That's a, that's a nice idea. Community service. Nice. Write it in your book. Perfect. Lovely. Sounds good. Sounds great. Um, but do you really believe it? Is it really who you are? Are you just saying it because, you know, you think you're supposed to be saying it? Now, here's the key, though. All this work had nothing to do with the business they were in. Sure. It had nothing to do with sales. It had nothing to do with inventory. It had nothing to do with with managing their 35 retail locations. It had nothing to do with the tactics of the business. But what happened is it had to do with the spirit of the organization. It went towards the culture of the organization. And what we found out is a year later when we went back, because we do a cultural assessment, when we went back and did the assessment, that their employee turnover was a quarter of what the industry standard was. Wow. Because their employees loved being a part of this organization. They loved the culture that was created by leadership, by leadership being accountable to create this culture as it's defined by their values. And so now what happens is they attract attract the best. They have lower turnover, which means they don't have the cost of training people. And in, in an area where, you know, unemployment is less than 3%, right. they're able to attract and retain the best. They're going to outperform their competitors and none of that connects to the tactics of their business and their industry. Yeah, and and again, I, I think what you've shown there is, um, you know, practical implementation. You know, by people, of, you know, of of the ideas, and that's something that you you know you don't always you don't always see because a lot of the times is, um, you know, even as I said, even if it's strategy or principle, it's it's never acted upon right it's never lived upon it lived out in in reality so tell me tell me a little bit more about culture because um a lot of organizations i've seen allow culture to develop kind of organically you know it's kind of what you turn into and it's for a variety of reasons or your experiences and eventually that becomes the overarching culture of the company but from what you're saying is culture is something that you should really be shaping and actively managing. And it's a dynamic thing, right? Well, absolutely. So here, here's the thing. First of all, um, one of the organizations I wrote about, the, 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 the leading shareholder of that organization is a gentleman by the name of Drayton McLean Jr. He took over a family a wholesale food distribution business that was doing two and a half million and sold it to Walmart uh, at $24 billion, okay? Mm -hmm. And he said that it's the CEO's number one responsibility to protect the culture. He didn't tell me that it was the CEO's number one responsibility to get a return on his, his investment, to make the stock go up, to, to, right. to, to put money on the bottom line. It's to protect the culture. Now, here's the thing. Every organization, as you said, has a culture. Every organization mm -hmm. has a culture. And I don't really like the term organic because that almost sounds healthy. The reality <laughs> is, yeah, I know. The reality is you either have a culture by design or you have a mm. culture by default. Right. And a culture by default, anything goes because your culture is what's accepted and what's repeated. Mm -hmm. A culture by design means that, that leadership has taken the time to decide this is the kind of culture that we want. We've defined it through our values. So they... They, they actually define their culture, they model the culture, they teach the culture, they protect the culture, and then they celebrate the culture. And it's through those five steps that you're able to create a culture by design and maintain it. Because just because you have this great culture today doesn't mean you're going to have one mm -hmm. tomorrow. I had a client that had um, oh, about 8,000 employees and they acquired a company with 8,500 employees. Right. And what they, what two years later, they brought us in because what happened is they, they, they had a great culture, but they had what we call culture drift. Mm -hmm. It wasn't exactly the way it was originally designed because they brought all these new people sure. in. And so they had to re up their efforts to, con to communicate and, and protect 
what the values were and what the culture was of that organization. Yeah, it's and it's fascinating. Um, like I said, because it's a the culture obviously evolves, and if you don't guide it, it can evolve and change. But I, the other part you said about the you know culture by default, right? Unfortunately, just I don't know human nature being what it is it tends to often default to not the best practices, right? You don't tend to, um, by default, best practices don't tend to happen, do they? Well, exactly. And that's going to fall on leadership. Mm -hmm. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Accountability is the highest form of leadership. Um, I was in front of a group of 300 business people the other day. Most of them were CEOs, presidents of their organization. And I asked them a simple question. I said, how many of you either have or work with someone who's negative? What percentage of the hands went up, do you think? Oh, 150%. Exactly. <laughs> you know, some people are putting both yeah. hands up, right? Um, and, and so um, there was one gentleman in the back of the room who happened to be the president of an organization that we had worked with that we that that we knew about? And I asked him. I said, "Michael, uh, do you work with anyone negative?" Now they're they're not the biggest organization, but they're sure. not small. They have about seven hundred employees. Mm -hmm. I said, "Do you work with anyone who's negative?" And he said, "No." And there was deathly silence <laughs> in the room. Well, here's the thing: they don't allow negative people to stay there. Mm -hmm. One of their values. Is, is you have to laugh at work. And if you don't laugh at work, they're going to fire you. Right. Now, now you can you can laugh at that, but the reality is... <laughs> well, if I, work, if I work there, I'd be laughing for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, so here's the deal. If you come to work and you're negative, uh, they're going to counsel you. They're going to mm -hmm. sit down. They're going to say, John, you know, we don't want negativity in our culture. We don't want negativity here. We want to have a good time together. We want to support each other. Mm -hmm. If I make a mistake, I want you to be able to point it out to me, not to make you feel good, but to help me. But it's reciprocal. We need to communicate. We're here as a team. We keep a positive attitude here. And we talked about that when we hired you. So we need to, you to up the game on your attitude. If you keep that up for another couple of weeks, John, you know what's going to happen? They're going to let you go. Now, they don't have anybody negative that works there. And guess what? Their people love working there because right. they don't have to work with negative people. Mm -hmm. Leadership has the ability to control that, to create that environment. But so many leaders, they're handicapped because they feel like they can't do that. Not only can they do it, it's their responsibility. And if they don't do it, they're not being accountable to their people to create this amazing environment. And if they're not being accountable, well, accountability is the highest form of leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. It's going to come back to them. Yeah, and, and I think part of it is, and this is something I've come across so many times, is that part of it is, you know, people are, and especially leaders and in, in, uh, the heads of businesses are so afraid of turnover, right? And sometimes you have to turn the business. So I, and to be honest, I, I ran a business once and I had to, had to change the culture. I had to turn over nearly 75% of the employees in the first year and a half, which was very frightening. It's quite a frightening thing to do, you know, and people are questioning, but Sometimes you have to do that to change the culture, right? But people really right. back off that sometimes. So here's the thing. First of all, if you allow me to stay in your culture and I'm not living the culture, mm -hmm. then you're saying the culture doesn't matter. And that as long as Sam goes out and makes sales, he can stay here. He can be a jerk. He can yeah. treat people wrong. I don't care about that. All I care about is sales. Now, what message does that send everyone else? A, B, everyone else is going to start to leave because they don't want to work with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. C, if you've fired somebody, then you've experienced this. And I ask this all over the world where I speak. I said, how many of you fired somebody? Hands go up. OK, right. I said a few weeks, a few days, a few hours after you fired somebody, someone has come up to you and they have said, what took you <laughs> so long? Mm -hmm. They don't want to be working around that person. And so if you're not letting that individual go, then you're not doing your job. Now, yeah. yes, you have to communicate on the front end. You have to teach the values. You have to teach the culture. You have to be living it in a modeling situation. Um, you have to be coaching your people. But if you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing as a leader on the front end, then you owe it to everyone to make sure you protect your culture. And letting go of those people who aren't living the culture is one way that you protect that culture. If you don't do it, you're not being an accountable leader, yeah. bottom line. Now, some people don't want to hear that. They really don't want to hear that. But yeah. 
Why should I live the culture if you're not living the culture, yeah, right? right? Why should I live the culture if Sue working in the cubicle next to me is not living the culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I think that's the and and I think we've all been guilty of it in the past. And the example that you raise is probably the best one. Is um, you know, you have a you have a salesperson who's you know meeting their quota or crushing their quota, but they're absolute nightmare for everybody to work with we've all been in that situation where we procrastinated because it's a hard thing to do to say goodbye right. to but as you say you're sending you know you have to defend yourself the whole time because you're sending the wrong message well exactly so here's the situation last week i was talking with the president of an organization they have 215 employees but they have a ton of subcontractors mm -hmm. and um pretty nice size home building organization. Uh, they, they operate in three different markets. They have a waiting list of people to buy their homes. They have a waiting list of people to buy wow. their homes. Okay, it's insane. Um, unemployment in their markets is less than 2.8%, which means mm -hmm. no one is really looking yeah. for a job. Yeah. When they have a job opening, their culture is so amazing. When they have a job opening, they average 100 applicants for that job. Wow. Now, I, I see this all the time. I'm up in South Dakota in Sioux Falls and man, talking with manufacturing companies up there. And they say, I can't afford to fire somebody. We can't hire. Mm -hmm. You can't afford to keep the person because if you let that person go and you create an amazing culture, yeah. you will attract so many people who want to work for you. And if you're attracting the best people, you're going to be the best. Yeah. And sometimes you get a productivity bump out of when people see that you have taken action and everybody's like, as you said, about time, you know, let's all come together and push through. Well, exactly. Now, imagine the sales force, because I, I was in Dallas, Texas one time and I had a group of about 40 executives in the room. And I said, what do you do when your number one salesperson disrespects two people on the team? And the CEO sitting in the front of the room, he says, I move him to a corner office so he doesn't have to see many people. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, great. So you're rewarding this. <laughs> and so now, yeah, I mean, the yeah. people in the organization, they know that it doesn't matter how you act. Yeah. Um, guess what? If they let that guy go, the rest of the people in the sales team, they're going to go, oh, my gosh, John let Bill go. And, which means two things. One, we can't act like Bill and stay here. OK, mm -hmm. but more important, the rest of the sales team goes John must believe in us. Yeah. John must believe that we can make up the difference. We've got to get together. We got to figure out how to make up the difference. And everyone raises their game. And that's how you create a high performance team where you're not dependent upon one performer. You have everyone performing at a high level. Everyone's living the culture. You're creating a place where people want to be. You don't have to manage people. No one wants to be managed. Mm -hmm. You lead. People want to be led, and they want to be led by an accountable leader. That's fantastic. I think it's a perfect note to end on, Sam. This has been fascinating. We could have gone on for another half hour at least. Um, before we Anytime. go, yeah, and, and I would definitely, I'd love to have you come back. But before we go, can you tell people just a little bit more about yourself, um, what your latest book is? You know, Sam is an author of, of a number of different books. Uh, if you want to talk about your latest book and how they can find out more about you. Well, I appreciate that. And and you can reach me at samsilverstein.com or uh, iamaccountable.com. And I've got several books out all around leadership and accountability. My latest book is called No Matter What, The Ten Commitments of Accountability. And it talks about 10 specific commitments that the accountable leader lives, of which the values are only one. And it's it's available, you know, online or certainly it's available on my site as well. And and my love, my, my mission is to build a more accountable world. I do that through my writing. I do that through speaking at uh, at events for organizations and then coming in house and either doing executive coaching or consulting through we have various tools and assessments where we help organizations build accountable cultures. Yeah, that's fantastic, Sam. And yeah, I'd highly recommend the book because I think accountability is huge. And so if if you take one thing away from today, everybody, and that's it, guess where accountability starts? Right with yourself. Yeah. Listen, Sam, this has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another expert inside interview really soon. Thank you. <laughs>